I mean, like your dad was a, one of the pioneers of bluegrass. You know, with the, with the songs he's written, you know. Yeah, yeah, I sure miss him, I'm telling you. Tell me, when, when was he, what year was he born? He was born in 23. Okay. Yeah. So he, he was the World War II generation. Yeah. He served for a, a while in World War II and mm -hmm. had an honorable discharge from an injury. Okay. At, right at the end of the war. And um, so they went ahead and discharged him. Yeah. Yeah. Is that something he... Did you ever talk about his war, war experience? Well, no. I mean, I mean, I mean, he did. He was in the Navy, mm -hmm. um, um, and it wasn't it wasn't a big, big thing. And the injury wasn't a war injury. He sat on. This is funny. <laughs> 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 so we won't tell this part. But but he sat on a bench and slid on a bench or something. Um, I can't remember what they were doing, but he ran a huge splinter into his hip, and they had to do surgery to take to take that out. Oof. It, it, that he felt, yeah, it felt like a two by four. So it took several stitches to um, repair. You know what? Yeah. What I don't know how. I don't remember if he ever said how it happened, but you know he just always made light of it. <laughs> Yeah. He said it's right. the only only war injury he had was you know surgery to get the splinter out of his butt. <laughs> <laughs> well, that you know that that's more than most people have experienced. Yeah. yeah. So he grew up in is it was it Wilkes County or? Yes, North Wilkesboro. Okay. He was born born in Glendale Springs over in um, Ash County, okay. but when he when he was real young. His parents moved down to some land that they had bought or inherited in, in Wilkes, and um, and um, so they moved down there, and the whole family then grew up there on Pennington Road, mm -hmm. right out of North Wilkesboro. Okay. In the, yeah. So he he <clears throat> he started early in uh, in like the Church Brothers. Probably, yeah, very familiar to to a lot of people who are into the older bluegrass and Jim Hall, Roy Hall, and the Blue Ridge Entertainers. Yeah, I mean that's pretty. That, that's like yeah. back to the real early days. Of yeah, that was that was that was early days, and he he uh, played with him and Roy and Jim Hall. Um, I've got pictures of him with both. Mm. If I remember right, and um, but yeah, those were very budding years of um, pioneers and bluegrass at that time. Roy Hall, let's see, he he was killed early he on. He was killed, yeah, in a car accident. Right, if I remember right? Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, W, I mean L. W. Lambert. Oh yeah, that was. Um, on later into um, the late 50s and early 60s, um, they played together, L.W. Lambert and the, uh, oh, Carolina Neighbors. Yeah, yeah, Carolina Neighbors. And they recorded two of my dad's songs. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you remember which one they were? Which they one? did. Um, the Battle Over in Korea. Battle over in Korea, and I will write another letter to you, darling. Okay. And then he wrote Stanley Brothers recorded. What is it? I'd they rather they be recorded for... Ralph and Carter recorded. I'd rather be forgotten. Yeah. And. Um, and Flat and Scruggs. And Flat and Scruggs recorded <laughs> Cabin in Caroline. Yeah, I mean, and that may be the epitome of a bluegrass. Song. I mean. Yeah. It's that all, you know, it's, a, it's yeah. a, the mother of all cabin songs, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that was Jimmy, Jimmy Shoemate on fiddle kicking that off. Yep, and Jim, Jim was my mom's cousin. Oh, okay. And him and Daddy grew up playing music together. And um, uh, both, uh, Daddy worked in Hickory for a time at the furniture factory. 
mm-hmm. and Hickory, Hickory and Lenore. So, you know, they they get together you know, quite often up there and and um and play together. They did all kinds of stuff and and dances and church events, church mm-hmm. socials I think they would say. Yeah. And and uh Let's see. Did, did they know? Well, Shoemaker knew Scruggs did, early he on. Did. Like before he, he did. He did. Did Monroe? Yeah, he did because um, Earl lived down at Shelby, and of course, uh-huh. um, with Jim there in Hickory, wasn't far uh, in between. And any, you know, they all of them you know, always looked for somebody close by to pick with. Yeah. And, and they knew one another um, early on, yeah, way before Monroe. Yeah. Yeah. So now he he was uh, not only a songwriter, of course. He played the fiddle and probably did. Yeah. It. Yeah. He played the fiddle, the mandolin were his, were his favorite instruments, I oh, guess. Okay. Yeah. And he played all of them, played anything with strings and. Um, right. Yeah. And he could rock a little bit on the piano, but then eh, not much. He he didn't ever tinker with the piano much, but um, but he could. But yeah, fiddle and mandolin, guitar, banjo, and, and the you bass. know he and the bass, of course. Yeah, and um, banjo. You know, he played. Um, he, he was he was toying like everybody else. You know, with that three finger roll stuff, and. After he cut his fingers off when he was 23, um, mm. he went back to playing the old two-finger style banjo, oh. using his ring finger and his little finger on that hand um, because he lost his index and middle finger. How did that happen? Um, in a bandsaw accident uh, at work. Okay, on the okay. job in right. Lenoir, yeah, he was working at a furniture factory, and he was making a base fiddle bridge on his lunch hour, oh. and uh, yeah. caught his caught his hand in the bandsaw. So he lost on his right hand. He lost his index and middle finger down to down to uh, the first joint from the hand, and um, on his left hand, he lost. Um, uh, he lost um, uh, middle finger, ring finger, and little finger down to about the same same length. Nice. Oh, so, yeah. It's hard to hear that. Right? Yeah, he he mm. had, he, he lost both 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 hands, uh, fingers on both hands. So man, that is so yeah, terrible. and that that was around forty seven when that happened and like I say he was 23 just not long out of service and um, I was in the hospital up in Lenore with mm-hmm. with my mom visiting my uncle and there was a photo hanging on the wall in there and um, I was admiring the photo because it was Doc Watson and a mm-hmm. fellow named Clarence Green who's not yeah. the Clarence Green that we knew oh yeah uh, but it was an older Clarence Green I've heard of him. That was, yeah. And. Was, was, it, was it his dad or? I don't, I don't know. I no. really, I don't know. Steve Kilby okay. might can answer that, but, but, um, but anyway, they were there in that photo and my dad was, um, he, he was in the photo and the nurses mm-hmm. there, the nurse's station asked me if I knew when the picture was made. And I told him, yeah, it would have been made in 1947. And the reason I knew was my dad's fingers were still in bandages. Oh, I see, I see. So this, you have this picture, or is this picture on online? I I have I have uh, that same photo now, and um, I have a copy of it, a hard copy. Matter of fact, I think uh, I think Steve Kilby sent me a copy of it. Okay. And because he he knew where the photo originated, and I think the Clarence Green that we knew actually had that photo. So so yeah. the other Clarence Green could have been you know, related. Yeah, like it wasn't too many years ago I actually found out that there were two Clarence Greens from the same mm-hmm. area. Right, right. Bluegrass, yeah. Yep, yep. 
And I didn't know the older Clarence Green. I, I can't say that I know him. I just had seen pictures of him. It's the only way I knew him. But, um, you know, uh, uh, the, Clarence yeah. Green, the Clarence Green, we knew he played with uh, with Shoemate. And, right. Uh, uh, Eric Ellis. And Eric Ellis and them, yep. Was it Ron Schultz or maybe? They played... Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Kimi Shoemaker got some, uh, he received the North Carolina uh, Heritage Award or something like that. Right. And, and right. Uh, we saw them at the uh, NC State Stewart Theater there. And Earl Scruggs received that prize the same same evening. At the same time. Yeah, I believe yeah. it is. Yeah. That was good. Yeah. So, so, you, so you met a lot of people just growing up. Where you you know in your family and with your dad, right? And what do you mean? What what is your earliest memory of, of meeting somebody like one of the great artists that you? Yes, wow. Mm-hmm. Well, you remember I mean, when you met you met Monroe? I did because um, Daddy would play often. You know, we lived in North Wilkesboro, and yeah. Daddy's band would be called Often down to come and open for a lot of the Opry stars um, down at Lake Norman Music Hall mm-hmm, over mm-hmm. in um, in Terrell. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that that's probably my earliest memory of meeting Bill would have been there. Yeah, he and, played there, you know. I have some live shows from there in, I think, 1967. They might. Yep. Yeah, 66 yep. So, so I remember meeting him there and seeing him there, and then, um, and then of course Bob and Sonny Osborne brothers. Anytime, yeah. anytime they were there, my dad usually was opening band, uh-huh. um, and that would have been in into the mid '60s. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've got photos with with all of them, and and. You know, just a lot of my a lot of my bluegrass idols played that little place over there, and and um, you know Jack Lawrence's dad mm-hmm. um, did the sound. He was a sound man. I did not know. <clears throat> yeah. You still you're in contact with with Jack? Um, periodically. Um. He's still in Charlotte. He's still in Charlotte. Yeah. So. He would I be an interesting guy to talk to. Jack is an he's an awesome fellow to talk to. And yeah. uh yeah. He would and be great for an interview, you know. He would be great for an interview with you and um yeah. it's a super super uh good fella. Yeah. And musician too, of course, you know. Oh gosh, phenomenal musician. Yeah. He he came to um, you know we did a we did a tribute for um, Al Wood A L Wood you know mm-hmm. we knew him as A L Wood um, yeah. and we did that tribute for A L back last July and um, Jack was really good to come and he was there and enjoyed uh, playing some with with A L and the guys. Hey, yeah, he's, he's a great guy to play with, you know, he can just, he never stop. Yeah. We sat yeah, off he... all night at, at the Bluegrass First Class a few years ago, and we played, me and him, to 7 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and there was not a sound in that hotel. We were, we put him all to sleep. <laughs> That's, and I think we were there that week. Um, oh, when yeah. when y'all were there, I, I wasn't. I didn't sit in and get. I didn't know that y'all were picking her. I probably would have set up with you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but we were there. Yeah. That same oh, year. Yeah. And then and so, you know that, this was funny because his son, uh, he, I can't think of his name right now, but he, Mike. Yeah. Yep. He, he he's a mechanic of some sort or a tool in the tool and die shop. Or, it turns out that the machine he works on was made in in my hometown. I mean, it's like 300, 400 yards from my house. Really? Yeah. That, and I that thought, is interesting. It's called Ushviken, but, you know, in English it would be a 
first vacant or something. But he, when he said that, I was like, wow, that is a small world. It is a small world. Yeah, indeed. So. Yeah, that whole family, they're ones that are so very talented also. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Al called me, um, oh, a couple weeks ago, and um, about three weeks ago now, I think, and uh, he said, I want to pick. He said, we, he said, I need to find somebody to pick with. I want to pick. <laughs> so, um, and so I told him, I said, yeah, you need to be out there picking. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Call me, I'm game. I'll have to get him down to Montgomery store on a Saturday night sometime and have you come. And just bring a few of of you down. He don't like to really get in a jam, per se, but he loves to get in a a good picking session with several several good musicians. And um, it's it's hard for him to play in a jam uh, jam setting um, because of his hearing. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, yeah, if a few players are, you know, it's better than a, a, a whole third of them. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we'll uh, have him down sometime. Yeah, that will be great. Get you uh, again. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, you, uh, you're you very active in the North Carolina Bluegrass Association. Tell me about how that happened. How did that come about? Well, I was a member from the from the beginning when Ron Ackerman established the um, uh, association, and mm-hmm. I wanted to be supportive, even mm-hmm. though Ron lived out in Goldsboro. So we didn't, I didn't have opportunity to get together a lot right. with him and the organization in the beginning, and um, I did go out and help him see. A couple shows that he was trying to get going on um, uh, for Raleigh TV, and uh-huh. we did. I think we did about four of those shows. What What year was this? That would have been about four years ago. Okay. Because I've been, I think now I've been president of the Bluegrass Association now for three years, and that was the year prior to my taking it taking it so Ron's Ron did a great job of, of um, getting the organization organization started and got the 501c3 um, status for the, the association and and um, was doing really good and then of course he worked for the military oh. and his job <clears throat> moved him back to Ohio which um, uh, was his hometown and he was going to have to give up uh, being president. So I think he started in July or August that year trying to get me to take it. And I didn't want it because I was involved in so much other stuff. And right. and um, I just didn't know, didn't know if I could do it justice. And I still don't know if I've done it any justice or not because we really haven't been able to really do a lot with the organization. Uh-huh. And um, so... Um, so anyway, I, I agreed and, and I took it, you know, to do, you know, what I can. And and then, um, so this year, what we're going to try to do is kick off a um, uh, North Carolina Bluegrass Association Youth Fest for um, workshops on May 30th at Shearer Presbyterian Church here in Mooresville. And it'll be workshops for students in bluegrass and um, from beginners right up through advanced, and we've we've got several instructors, yourself of course, yeah. um, on board already that yeah. want to uh, help out with this. Who, who will be there? Do you know? Do you remember? Okay, so I've got um, Carrie Webster has Carolina Folk Works in Salisbury, mm-hmm. and she's got several instructors under under her. Okay. And then um, Josh Green down in Pageland, um, South Carolina area. He's yeah. just over the border. We still say he's North Carolina, so. <laughs> yes, I can. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we've got him. He's on board, and um, and then um, uh, yourself. I don't have my notes with me to tell you the mm-hmm. others that have confirmed, but um, 
we'll have we'll have um, probably about eight instructors. Okay. And, uh, we'll start about ten in the morning and do two classes, uh, a ten o'clock and eleven o'clock class, and then break for lunch, and then have a a one o'clock and a two o'clock class, and um, and then um, in the afternoon, and everybody's going to be working on the same tunes, mm -hmm. um, whether they're novice or advanced, yeah. and um, and then um, um, about four from yeah four to five, we're going to have a all camp all camp jam. We'll just you know corral everybody, That's and nice. um, and and then in the evening, we'll have some of these students that um, uh, <clears throat> perform in youth bands. So mm -hmm. we'll have some of those um, that can perform in a concert in the evening, like from 7 to 9 or 7 to 10, whatever, uh, and our instructors that are that have their own group, uh, like you, you know, in your group. <laughs> and um, so we can have a concert in the evening. And the great thing about here Presbyterian Church, we have a huge support there with David Christian, and um, he has Mooresville Bluegrass once a month, okay. and uh, it's um, hosted there at the church. So we have we have the grounds outside. If, if the weather's nice, you know we can have the workshops outside under tents. Mm. And if if in case of inclement weather, we have the classrooms inside the. Uh, in a climate-controlled environment. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, that's good. I so that's, hope, hope you have good weather. I hope so. I'm just, I'm just hoping and praying that we'll have really good weather for this. Since it's, it's the first, first uh, time that you know we've we've tried this, you know, to invite um, our kids across the state that are in classes and um, bring them, bring them all together. And yeah. we lucked up. Um, uh, Dale Morris is really great, and he's put together the calendar for all the fiddlers' conventions and events uh, taking mm -hmm. place in North Carolina, Southern Virginia, and, and then some in South Carolina. So May w ended up having five Saturdays this year. Oh, really? That's so good. there was nothing. There was nothing on May 30th um, scheduled. So there's no other event that's going to clash with it. Yeah. Right? So we looked up. So we're going to give it a shot and um, see how many kids we can bring. And um, it won't ki it won't cost the kids anything to come. Yeah. And well, um, is there like a website or some kind of link that you can give the people? There, there is. And David Christian there with Mooresville Bluegrass, he is our webmaster. Okay. And um, it's um, um, ncbluegrassmusic.org. Okay. And um, so he and I text back and forth like before last as we were firming up the dates and stuff. And uh, so he'll have that on the website and then we'll put more, we'll put up a poster on the website. And then also on Facebook, North Carolina Bluegrass Association on Facebook. Okay, good. North Carolina Facebook, on Facebook, North Carolina Bluegrass. Very good. Um, Let's see. I wanted to ask you about your your operation down there at the at Gold Hill. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember playing that back in the mid nineties. Oh yeah, new vintage. So you, how long have y'all been doing that? You came. I think you came one year when I did a um. um I think you came and played. Now we we have our Founders Day celebration here at Gold Hill, and it's always the fourth Saturday in September. You might have played it, but I would think you more than likely played at the Ralph Pennington Memorial Bluegrass Reunion. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That, I hosted yeah. several of those starting in '96. That's about yeah. That's about right. '96, '96. Yeah. That first mm -hmm. year. The first year was in June of '96, and it was hot as blue blazes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, I know we played. We played like uh, 
some event in Salisbury, like, you know, Sunday in the park or Saturday in the park or something like that. And then okay. rolled up the road a, a little ways and, and played a good play. Okay. You you might have played at Sloan Park in Salisbury, too, because uh, yeah, the Akin Valley Folklore yeah. Society was yeah. doing events at that time. Yeah, but that's right. We did. We yep. played uh, two years in a row. Yep. Yeah. Because I would, um, several years there, uh, I had my cloggers there at the uh, at Sloan Park for mm-hmm. the Folklore Society. But yeah, I'm I'm thinking that that's probably where you played. Yeah. I tell you, it's it's hard to remember. All the some gigs I can remember thirty years ago, and, and, and some I have. <laughs> I can't year. remember from last week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, so, uh, you have a weekly jam there on Friday nights. I I uh, always try to catch some of your videos. We do, them. and I I try to do a live stream, you know, for you know a couple of the uh, um, <clears throat> songs that we do, and. Um, we're, we're known for banjo players here. <laughs> mm-hmm. they, just, they just come out of the woodwork. But um, yeah, there's some good ones there, you know, like Danny But we have, we really have some phenomenal musicians coming every mm-hmm. week, and we're Hoppy and I are just so blessed to have so many great friends in mm-hmm. the music industry that love to come. And we try to we try to uh, run a tight ship where everybody's welcome, and um, the circle's always open. Uh, we have a circle, a half circle of chairs and a half circle of stools behind that, and then more in the back room. And yeah. Montgomery's store is not very big at all. At tops, we seat about 50 watching the music, and there's no admission charge. Um, there's no payment to any of the musicians. They wouldn't take it if we tried to give it to them. <laughs> uh-huh. And and it's just a great. We have we have musicians who are beginners, novice yeah. on on their instruments. Right. And and they feel welcome because everybody that comes shares their music. Yeah. And they're always they're always. Um, uh, so respectful of our young players. Yeah. And, yeah, and not not e- not even just the young players, but other novice musicians that are learning. Yeah. You know, that are our age learning, yeah. and mm-hmm. they're they're very quick to say, you know, come on up here, you know, you know, get in a circle, and you know, and a lot of times, you know, those beginners don't want to get up to the mic, and that's mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. But because they're learning, and they're learning that sense of timing and and um, how a jam how a jam needs to be. Yeah, I mean that's it's it's just true folk music. That's that's what folk yeah. music is. It is, and yeah, you know, for for a long time we kept a full set of mics up, and everybody tends to try to get in the mic all at one time when it's mm-hmm. set up that way. So I decided, okay, I've got a vocal mic and I've got an instrument mic. And everybody would go around the circle and everybody takes a turn coming up. And they can pull anybody out of that circle to come up and take a break. They would usually turn around and nod yeah. you know, to somebody, come up and take a solo in their song. Mm-hmm. And it just works. Mm-hmm. It it just works. And we've had a lot of compliments on on the jam, whereas, you know, everybody gets a turn and um, nobody feels left out. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's wonderful. I mean, and also, it, music is such a force that it, it, it'll bring people together. And I think it, it's brings, it does, it yeah. brings people together. Yeah. And people and love it, to come, you know, the nostalgia of this old store. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the community around it. It's not just one old store. It's an old gold mining town. So yeah. there's about eight or ten shops here. Of course, they're not open on Friday nights. Sometimes um, the shop across the street, Monty's store, sometimes he'll be open late on Friday yeah. nights. 
and um, the restaurants open and and but you know, a lot of times people come early, grab a bite to eat, and then come over for the music at seven and yeah and it's a unique it's really a unique old mining town that we've restored yeah. and we're really proud of it. You know, the music brings people together that never would meet otherwise. You know? Oh, you're right. I mean, like, right. and, and the great, like, the, there's really no issue what what AIDS are. I mean, I I remember being with uh, with Jerry Stewart. So, you know, he was the oldest, and then it was me, and then Chris Sharp, and mm-hmm. then Nate, Nate, Nathan Aldridge. You know, sort of like. Four generations. Four generations. Right, and totally could relate and talk about the same thing. And, you know, that's pretty rare these days. Yeah, right. But, you know, in in folk music and bluegrass and folk music, any of the traditional music, you can put those four generations together and they can have the best conversation. Yeah. Yeah, there's no... No well, age difference. would understand that what they're talking about. These conversations get really esoteric and <laughs> really nerdy. <nervous. laughs> I remember kind of over listening to what just the Chris and and uh, Jerry were talking about, and that was about some banjo forward roll or some very like down to the atomic level, subatomic level, you know. Mm-hmm. And analyzing some bands, and I, I thought, you know, nobody, and how many people would even understand what these people are talking about? You know, they wouldn't have a clue. No, no, wouldn't have a clue. No. So, but then yeah. to to sit down and listen to those four, um, then sometimes sometimes people that have never experienced the music can sit and watch. You know, a lot of people says, well, you know, I don't like bluegrass or I don't like folk music, but they've never experienced it live. Right, right. And once they sit down and watch it live, they're mesmerized. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, you know, I mean, I see the case with my kids, you know, they've always been around the music. So to, to them, live music, or, I mean, they, they always like it, you know, but it's not, not the big deal. Mm. But because they they grew up in right, right. But, but then you go play for kids who who didn't haven't been around much live music, and a lot of times they get totally mesmerized, as you said. Right. It's 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 amazing, and it's it's an amazing genre of music. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, our boys, you know, like your kids, our boys. We have two boys, and uh-huh. they both grew up just like I did, you know, um, going to uh, bluegrass events and festivals and, and, mm. um, and, you know, every weekend for the longest time, Hoppy and I had um, a music uh, store called the Fifth String and Company. Yep. And we were at all the major bluegrass festivals in the Southeast for almost 20 years. Yeah. And um, so our kids grew up around all these people, and um, and have have a you know a lot of respect for the music. Uh-huh. They don't they don't play bluegrass. They they love music, but yeah. they love their own you know their own music. And we never pushed it on them. Both of them took a year of um, violin mm-hmm. music. I wish I had been involved with Mark O'Connor at the time when those when our boys were beginning because yeah. they took it for a year and but it wasn't for them. From from like the private teacher. Or yeah, it was it was through the uh, Salisbury Symphony and it was symphony okay. classes that were taught after school uh-huh. in Rowan Salisbury schools and uh-huh. they benefited by the classes. And they have the common knowledge of what they learn, you know, through that year. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but it just it wasn't their cup of tea. You know, they yeah. love music and they love music events and stuff, but um, not necessarily bluegrass. Right. But you, you mentioned the name okay. there. You, you said something about Mark O'Connor, and that's that, that, that leads us to the next topic here. Uh, so... 
What do you, how, how did you get up with Mark O'Connor? He, first, um, he, he needs no introduction, everybody who listens to <laughs> Mark Right, everybody knows who Mark is. I, I, um, I remember buying his first C, uh, LP, the, the one where he was like a 12 year old fiddle champion. It was, right. It was, it right. Was, I've got his I've got his guitar album. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> yeah. Well I've I've got quite yeah, a few I, but I probably yeah. have you know, the the one the fluid drive album there. Yeah. That 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 two fluid drive where, where he and, and Crary and Tony Rice played. Oh yeah. That's oh my good. gosh, yeah. There's some really good stuff. Yeah. And you know, I used to I used to be able to uh catch American music shop. Oh yeah. Um and um watched that and uh through the years and and just had followed his music through the years because he was a phenomenal musician and you know with being in a bluegrass family um yeah but you know these these prodigy kids come along and just you remember, blow you away did you see him here in north carolina uh back in the 70s or Maybe the only place that I can think that I saw him, and I remember, I, th- I think I saw him one time, and I have a feeling it was probably Galax, and he and I have uh-huh. talked about that. Um, yeah. It probably would have been Galax. I don't think I don't think he came to Union Grove um, mm-hmm. back in the day, yeah. but um, but Galax is is one that that he he does remember, and we we joked about it last year. I told him I said we ought to just. You know, register you in Galax. <laughs> I <don't know> name. <laughs> we wouldn't do that, but you know, we'd get run out of the park. <laughs> but when he and Maggie moved to um, Charlotte, um, uh, almost four years ago now, in the spring of be four years, um, he contacted me right away and and asked if. You know, we could do some stuff together, and and um, uh, I said, "Oh my gosh, yeah, of course, you know, let's do it." So right away, they had been in Charlotte um, about four weeks, and we did a free concert on the lawn at the library in Salisbury, mm. and um, and it was great. We had probably three hundred fifty, four hundred people, and we didn't really have time to advertise it, and. Mm. Um, just to introduce them, you know, to the community and and um, and uh, to North Carolina, yeah. and then um, and then he moved the O'Connor camp from New York to Charlotte. We started looking for somewhere to um, um, host the O'Connor camp, and Myers Park Baptist Church has just been a godsend. And it's a great facility, and um, so we use the campus there for the O'Connor camp in July, the last week in July. And, and do you have a, a, a email or a URL for that? It's um, um, O'Connor Method String Camp dot com. I'm pretty sure that's it. Um, well, you can just Google, I guess, O'Connor can. Oh, you can you can find it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so so that's a, a, a week long event. It is. It starts on this year's event. Um, starts on the twenty sixth. Our orientation is on the twenty sixth of July, and that's on a Sunday. And then the camp starts on the twenty seventh and runs through. That Friday, which I think will be August the first, okay. I think that's the way it is. Yeah, yeah it runs through the thirty-first of July. It starts on twenty-seventh and runs through the thirty-first. Okay, that sounds exciting. And the, the thing about the thing about the O'Connor method that people are really excited about is it's American music. Uh huh. And that's why I said if my boys were learning violin with with songs that they could relate to sure. and knew, sure. um, they might would have stuck with it longer. 
Mm-hmm. And I think 85 or 90 percent of the of the students that start uh, with this method stay with it. Yeah. They don't get bored with it because it's it's music that we can relate to and um, tunes that are familiar. Exactly. So you don't have to worry about you know learning like you know learning new material. You already know it. Some heart. of it you already know, yeah, because it's because like the know. tune the tune is familiar, and he's just got a unique way of teaching through this method, mm-hmm. starting with book one, that yeah, that, book uh, one. that just simplifies it and yeah. is easy easy for under to understand. We had we've had kids that come to O'Connor Camp that couldn't read music. Uh huh. But they go away with the knowledge of reading music. Yeah. And beginning then, by the end of the week, uh, beginning to know the basics of reading the music. And mm-hmm. um, that is that is so helpful, you know, through a lifelong um, music career. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's... It, you can always discuss with how, how important it is to read music, but I, I'd say learn as much as you can. You know, play by oh, ear. Yeah, and, exactly. And read or in the opposite way. You know, it's either way. Mm-hmm. You know, like yeah, the classical musicians, and a lot of times they they think that you know playing by ear is almost something mysterious or you know or <laughs> something weird. And and at the same time, a lot of the bluegrass people think that if you can read music, sight read real well, you're a genius. So it's it's just like m- mutual, you know, respect as well as a little bit right. of fear, you know. And I've, I've been trying over the years to bridge, to build a bridge between the two communities. But oh, yeah. You know, I've, I've taught a lot of classical players to, to play bluegrass and stuff. Mm. And it's and it's great. Um, you know, I know a lot of classical musicians that are awesome bluegrass fiddlers. Yeah, and, I had and, like one student guy, uh, 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 who is uh, in the North Carolina Symphony, Jackie Sayed Wolborski, and uh, she's such an awesome player. So when she's kind of come for lessons here it's like <laughs> well you know but but she also has has a humility for the music and it's not like I'm classically trained I can play and it's so you know a lot of times the classical players come and they didn't want to learn how to play the devil went down to Georgia or Orange Blossom special but she right. and I asked her so who who have you been listening to so far you know and I she didn't expect much and she she said, well, well, here's some of the stuff. And, and it was like Bobby Hicks and Ricky Skaggs. So stylistically, she was right on, on point. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So, Bobby uh, Hicks was one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> without a doubt, the main, the, probably the most influential bluegrass fiddler in the last 40 years. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, late 70s when he came back to Bluegrass, he came back to Greensboro, and, you know, he had been out there in Vegas for so long. Mm-hmm. So he didn't, when he came back here, he didn't even know who Tony Rice was. Oh, yeah. Because he had left Monroe in, in what, 58 or something? Yeah. And went out to Vegas. So he hadn't had been around any Bluegrass for all those years, up until, like, what, 77 or something? Right. Right. So, yeah, yeah. so uh, this this uh, O'Connor camp once again uh, always just Google O'Connor camp. So, how many students do you think will show up? Um, we had more than a hundred students last year. The first year we had about a hundred and thirty, and I don't remember the exact number last year. One hundred twenty. Plus, probably, yeah. and um, and we can accommodate up to 150 students at okay. the campus, and um, we're already getting calls um, and registrations. I'm going to encourage my, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna see can encourage some of my students to go. Oh yeah. And, and they'll have they'll have a really good time. Oh sure. Yeah. There's um there's a uh, host hotel nearby, and there's a shuttle from the hotel uh, daily, um, uh, back and forth to the campus uh, yeah. for anybody that doesn't drive. And the classes are from nine to noon, and then we break at noon for an hour for lunch. And yeah. um, and then um, start back at one and go to um, three, and then there's a um, recital from three to four, and students can choose any kind of uh, any any tune that they want to work on or song they want to work on, and they can ask any of the instructors to help them and yeah. and perform in a recital setting with them, and it's not mandatory. That uh, that they do recital every day. They sign up for it as they get confident with the music. Uh-huh. And then um, there's an all-campus orchestra, and um, all the students are paired with the instructors. And if they stay after they stay after um, three, they have to be in the orchestra. Yeah. And then um, then following the orchestra, there's a uh, all camp jam where all the chairs are just in a huge circle in Shalom Hall and um, Mark uh, works his way around the room giving everybody a chance to solo on a song you know yeah. um, you know in the song and everybody playing the same tune and yeah we have yeah. kids five years old that can just fiddle like crazy yeah. <laughs> and, and it's amazing to see all ages uh, yeah. Able to able to um, do that jam together. Yeah, I mean, how many how many situations do you find all four or five generations being involved in the same activity? That's pretty. From rad. the yeah, from the from the same um, family, it, it's it's rare, you know. Yeah. And um, so they're going to be teaching violin. Most uh, or do you have other other instruments? Well, we have. Core classes, of course, uh, core classes are, are violin, and um, then you have electives, which um, Forrest, uh, Mark's son, does a mandolin elective. Um, Joe Smart, um, who's a uh, multi-winner, uh, uh, <laughs> a Grammy winner plus uh, Winfield guitar champion, um, he does the guitar elective. Um, Kate does not only uh, the violin class that she does, um, she also does uh, a vocal class, a uh, voice class, or an elective. And, um, and everybody, um, Mark does the teacher training um, uh, the whole week. He has uh, students in, in, um, to be certified in the O'Connor mm-hmm. method. And then Maggie, she does uh, violin classes, and um, Maggie has a unique uh, chopping technique, uh, several different chopping techniques. So she does an elective on chopping. But but we have the other instruments, too. We have a, a bass elective, and um, so everybody, you know, maybe, maybe violin's not your thing, but you get to work with these other musicians. Oh, yeah. In in a, in a core class, you know, for your instrument, if if you're not a fiddler or a violinist. Yeah. yeah. I just, there is, it sounds like a uniquely interesting event and uh, what an opportunity to to get to study with somebody like Mark O'Connor. You know. Yeah, it's. It's a great opportunity, and the whole week uh, comes together at the end of the week with, on Thursdays, there's uh, there's recitals open, open to everybody to come and watch, mm-hmm. and um, at the end of the evening, and then on Friday is the play down recital, which starts with those students, with Mark and Maggie, there might be a handful 
that are proficient in book five of the O'Connor method. And, um, and then that group is joined by those that are proficient in songs from book four. Uh-huh. And then students that are proficient in songs from book three join. Yeah. And then book two students join, and then those that are still in book one yeah. come up and join. So before your before the the total concert ends, everybody that's that's at any level are uh, on stage and down in front of the stage. You have over a hundred musicians um, uh, playing the songs. Yeah. And everybody, and everybody knows all the songs. Yeah, got it. Fantastic. So, how, how is the picking going on there tonight? Um, it's it's going good, and I elected to uh, come out because because I can't hear in the store when the music's going on to to uh, talk on the phone. So, um, I have I have my car running, and it's um, outside. Yeah, and and got you a, and, and my seat's warm, so I'm good. Yeah, and, that's. Um, and so, so I'm sitting here in my car, just outside my door. Yeah. Well, I, I'm gonna th- thank you so much for talking to me about these these things. It's it's been really interesting, and I hope we can talk again soon. Uh, so, but I, I'm just gonna uh, say, say uh, good night here, and then we'll talk very soon again. Okay. Jan, thank you so very much thank for you, you. for everything that you're you're doing as well, and uh, I appreciate all these videos and audio recordings that you continue to uh, host and and put out there on YouTube. Yeah, well, you know, it's uh, I think it's important that we try to salvage. It is. You hear know, the, these the horror stories, like uh, I was told that. Like W uh, W P T F Raleigh Station. At, at some point here in the 70s, they uh, there was a new station uh, director or manager or whatever. Uh, he decided that all the old stuff was going to just be thrown away. So oh, no. like you know, you think P T F they had like. The Monroe Brothers, they had like oh my gosh, Johnny and Jack and Chet Atkins and Flatten Scruggs and I mean just all these different gimmies were all you know they, they were uh, contracted to play with the yeah space, you know so wow. that that all went to the landfill all those old pictures oh. and set lists and God knows what you know that that, that is it's that is heartbreaking it is. It, it really is. It's just insanity, you know. Yeah. So, and I know it's, you know, I've, I always felt like I had to get as much out there as I uh, as I can, you know. Yeah, it needs to be preserved. Yeah. And then there is that for the future for everybody to listen to. Exactly. Yeah. So, well, we'll talk again very soon. Right. Please tell uh, right. Mr. Hoppy I said hello. I will tell him. I will head back in and, and, and I'll let him. And everybody there. Is Jim Burris there? Jim uh, Burris is here. Yeah, tell him he I is. said hi. I will tell him. All right. Yeah. I'll tell All everybody right. you said hello. All right. Take okay. care. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Okay. Good night. All right.